introduce Christine Bacor, who will tell us about uh, categorical differentiation of homotopy functors. Thank you. Before I start my talk, since this is the last talk of the seminar, I hope that you'll join me in thanking Mark Behrens, Bob Brunner, Paul Gorst, Dan Isaacson, and Vesna Stoyanoska for organizing this conference. Um, I invite you to use the chat for a second if you want to express that in any way. Um, but it is a miracle to how I notice that there are people here from many different continents and time zones, and it's a miracle that we're able to do this way. And I appreciate the work that went into organizing it to make it happen. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take the chat back um, in just a moment here. Um, as so, I'm I'm talking about categorical differentiation of homotopy functors, and this is uh, this talk has to do both with my work on a project that we affectionately call BIORT, that stands for Brenda Johnson, well, Christine Bauer, Brenda Johnson, Christina Osborne, Emily Real, and Amelia Tebby, and um, and in work that I've that's recently been posted on the archive with Matthew Burke and Michael Ching and myself. Okay. The way that I'm planning on conducting this talk is that I'm gonna, I have some, pre, some slides that are kind of pre-populated but empty. Um, and if you want the full version of them, oh shoot. I see that I cut and paste something more than what I wanted to cut and paste. So if you'll just ignore the first part of that, I'd appreciate it. Um, Anyway, at the bottom of that, there's a link to some slides. And if you want to follow along, if I'm going too fast or too slow, then one way to do that is to click on that link and the slides, the populated slides will be there. And then as I'm filling things in, you'll be able to, to see it. Okay. So what I wanna to talk to you about today has to do with a notion in category theory called Cartesian differential categories and also tangent categories. And um, the notion of these notions came about in category theory because of the idea that somehow differentiation is really ubiquitous. And um, we know that in, in homotopy theory because we've been working with functor calculus and using analogies with Taylor series for a long time. So what I wanna to talk to you about today is how to use those categorical notions of differentiation to make some of the analogies that we've been using for a long time really precise. Um, Blute, Kocken, and Seeley, who are the inventors of Cartesian differential categories, note that one of the funda most fundamental concepts in all of mathematics has been differentiation. And of course, it comes about in a lot of different places, which is why we should be thinking about this as something that belongs more, pre more precisely inside of category theory. All right, so let's start with a motivating example. So I'd like to look at the category smooth. And this is a very familiar category, despite the fact that it maybe has an unfamiliar name. The objects of this category are natural numbers or if you prefer, they're the vector spaces Rn. And the morphisms of this category are smooth maps. From Rn to Rm. And um, from the time that we talk to our calculus students, we tell them that for a functor f from Rn to Rm, the Jacobian gives rise to a directional derivative. I'm just going to write down notation for the Jacobian because I'll use a capital D for that. And for the directional derivative, I'll use a nabla. So of course, what I mean is that the directional derivative is the Jacobian of F evaluated at A and in the direction of the vector V. So maybe I can decorate the Vs to make that more clear. All right, great. So that's an easy category. And um, this is a way of saying that every arrow in this category has a derivative. And that derivative 
satisfies a whole slew of properties that I'm only going to go through very quickly. Um, now, NABLA itself, the directional derivative operator is linear. Um, the directional derivative is linear in the direction variable. There's a chain rule that's satisfied. The Jacobian of the identity is the identity matrix. Um, derivatives commute with products in smooth, meaning that if I have um, two functors from Rn to Rm, then I can form a product Rn times Rn by just kind of sticking these things together. These Ns and Ms could be different, but you'll forgive me for writing them the same. Um, and that commutes with differentiation. So I don't mean the product rule. Derivatives of linear functions are simple and mixed partial derivatives agree. And in fact, these properties determine the directional derivative. This is essentially the idea of Cartesian differential categories. So Blute, Cockett, and Seeley defined a Cartesian differential category to be a Cartesian left additive category. So you should just think of that as a category that has products and in which you can add things with a differential operator like the directional derivative that satisfies, well, these seven properties, but these seven properties are just the axiomatic analogs of the ones that I showed you in the category smooth. So these are exactly the conditions on linearity, the chain rule, et cetera. That, um, that I showed you a moment ago. Okay. Um, I also wanna point out that linearization, sorry, that differentiation is very closely related to linearization. Um, in a paper that just appeared recently, Cockett and LeMay showed that in fact, a category has differentiation if and only if it has linearization. All right. So, how does this relate to functor calculus? Well, so first of all, I'd better tell you what kind of functors I'm looking at. So let f from c to d be a homotopy functor. And if you want, you can think of this as a homotopy functor of model categories. And a little later on today, I'm gonna to talk about them being homotopy functors of quasi categories. Um, but if you're not happy with either of those, I really have two situations in mind today. Either F is a functor of abelian categories, which is the setting of classical homological algebra, or F is a functor of topological spaces. Maybe I'll decorate these to indicate that there's a base point. All right, then um, functor calculus uses as its most basic unit, the notion of being excisive. So a functor like this is excisive If it takes homotopy pushouts to homotopy pullbacks, in particular. F of the co-product of X and Y is equivalent to F of X times F of Y. Okay, um, in some cases that condition is the same thing or at least implies that you're additive. In particular, in the abelian case where the category has byproducts, being excisive is the same thing as being additive. Um, and we will say that a functor is linear if it's reduced and excisive. I just have a little warning on the bottom of the page that this notion of linearity in the abelian case, this is exactly what Cockett and LeMay have in mind when they say that a category has differentiation, if and only if it has linearization, but in general, they're different because in general, our categories don't have byproducts. Okay, um, by now, functor calculus is well known, but if you'll just permit me a slight, a small introduction, um, for any functor of this type, there's a Taylor series like tower of approximations. Um, where 
the idea is that PNF is the best N excisive approximation to F. And excisive is something like what I just told you excisive was, except that instead of taking just push out diagrams to pull back diagrams, you have to take n plus one cubicle push up diagrams to n plus one cubicle pull back diagrams. And um, the functor D1F is exactly this. It is both reduced, meaning that it takes the base point to the base point, and excisive. And we say that this is the linearization of F. OK, so as I told you a moment ago, linearization is very closely related to differentiation. And this is the the main theorem of the Bjort paper, that um, this notion of linearization gives you exactly a notion of differentiation. The homotopy category of abelian categories is a Cartesian differential category. To have that, I have to tell you what the differential, differential operator is. So the derivative nabla f evaluated in the direction v at the, at the um, object A is the linearization of the functor F A plus blank evaluated in the direction B. So that notion of the directional derivative, which goes back to a paper by Johnson and McCarthy, um, that notion of the directional derivative, in fact, satisfies all of those criteria that I told you about earlier making this into a Cartesian differential category. Um, one of the main things that we did in this paper was, was refine a chain rule um, and define a chain rule. And, um, and what we ended up getting out of that was a higher order chain rule, which was not generally um, known. So that's, that's kind of what, what we did in that Bjork project. And the advantage of having done that is that this provided an abstract framework that made analogies between classical functor calculus and, um, sorry, classical calculus and functor calculus explicit. So of course, after we did this for abelian categories, the question was, can we generalize this? We have functor calculus, homotopy functor calculus in many different settings. And in particular, I told you that in this talk, I would be thinking about the abelian setting and also thinking about functors from topological spaces. So the very next thing that we wanted to do was see if it turned out that we could generalize this to functors of topological spaces. And when you try to do that in exactly the same way, you run into problems almost immediately, which I alluded to earlier. Topological spaces don't have byproducts. So the notion of linearization doesn't quite match up with the notion of linearization that's in the categorical context. So you have to move to something else. OK, so maybe I'll just um, I've left myself a slide to remind you to say, to remind myself to say the thing that I just said, which is just that um, linearization in the sense of functor calculus is not the same as linearization in the sense of the categorical notion defined by Cockett and LeMay. So something else has to happen. And it turns out that categorical, that Cartesian differential categories are not actually the right setting at all for what you need to do to try to generalize this idea. And instead, we need to move to tangent categories. So um, let me, again, like I did before, give a quick motivation of what a tangent category is. I'm going to be a little bit um, hand wavy here. So let's start with the category of smooth manifolds, which has as its objects exactly what it sounds like. These are finite dimensional. Smooth manifolds. A 
and the morphisms are smooth maps between these. Then any smooth manifold has a tangent bundle. And in fact, this defines a functor from smooth manifolds to itself. And this functor comes equipped with some structure. Actually, this functor comes equipped with a lot of structure. And that's why I'm going to be a little bit hand wavy here, because there's so much structure that I don't want to try to write it all down in this talk. To even put it in slides would take me several slides to do so. But in particular, let's just note that um, there's a natural transformation. P from the tangent bundle functor, functor to the identity, which just takes the tangent bundle and um, projects. This is just the usual projection of the tangent bundle. And um, let's see, I've run out of space here, but I'll try to say this. Um, amongst the properties that I care about with this is that somehow the tangent spaces, so this tangent this projection map allows me to define a tangent space by taking the fiber over a point. And when I do that, somehow what I get as my tangent space should be flat. This is exactly the notion that we have of what tangent spaces are supposed to do in differential geometry, which is really where I'm working right now. So most notably, the tangent bundle of any tangent space should be the same, should be trivial. And trivial in this case is just going to mean that it's a product of the tangent space with itself. So there are a number of axioms that we can use to try to generalize this into a notion of a tangent category. And that is exactly what Rosicki first did. And this was later written down by Cuffin and Crutwell um, in a slightly modified way. Um, to make it so that what we know about differential geometry could be axiomatized in a way that could be used in general in categories. So I'm going to show you how to do this, but I'm going to show you in a different format. Um, rather than writing down the, the many, many axioms that there are in this category, I want to show you a different formulation of this using Bay modules. OK, so there is a symmetric monoidal category They. whose objects are commutative algebras of the, a certain type. So I'm going to think about these as algebras over the the natural numbers. That idea of working over the natural numbers instead of, say, the integers comes from the fact that um, the category theorists who are working in this area have applications in theoretical computer sciences where the notion of negative doesn't have a really nice interpretation. So um, that's why we're looking at these. And these algebras have to be polynomial algebras over the natural numbers that satisfy this relation. I'm going to mod out by certain pairs, products of by products of um, some of the variables, but not necessarily all of them. And the condition that tells me when I want to, uh, what's allowed in terms of which things I'm allowed, um, I have to mod out by. I always have to mod out by x i squared for each i, and whatever I get in the end should be isomorphic to the natural numbers plus something left over, some kind of ideal that's left over, where i is idempotent. potent. 
Okay. And then the morphisms are what you would expect them to be. Morphisms are just maps of commutative, augmented, and algebras. And then um, I said this was symmetric monoidal. It's symmetric monoidal under the usual tensor product. Okay, so um, there's just a couple of features of this category that I want to tell you about. So first of all, I'm just going to use W to denote the special commutative augmented and algebra nx mod x squared. Um, sometimes this is called the dual numbers. Um, it's easy to formulate the coproduct and the product. The coproduct just ends up being the ring on, on uh, two polynomial variables mod out by x squared y squared, and that's just the tensor product of W with itself. And the product is just the ring on two polynomial variables mod out x squared, y squared, and additionally, xy. So one thing that's really nice about the category of A is that, in fact, knowing those two operations tells you what every object in the category is. They're all of this form, products of W, and then tensor products of those. And the idea is that in this category, that dual number ring plays the role of infinitesimal curves. So I can use this to come up with a definition of tangent category that doesn't require me to have quite so many axioms. Um, before I do that, I just want to point out that there are two special pullbacks in this category that I'll need to refer to. The product turns out to be the pullback of the diagram formed by taking the co-product of W in itself and multiplying over the unit. And um, another thing that's special is that um, if I take A tensor W, sorry, I, I'll, I'll say what I mean in a moment. So the second diagram has to do with what happens when you take um, co-products and products uh, sorry the last one is just a tensor of the natural number so I'll just leave it off because that's the unit okay um, that the co-product has to distribute over taking products so if I take the pull pull back over products wm and wn then the tensor product just preserves that so the first of these is sometimes called the universality of the vertical lift. And the second um, just tells me something about, preserve, as I said, preserving products. OK, okay with all of that information, here is a theorem that I'm taking as definition. So Pun Liang showed that the axiomatic presentation of tangent categories is equivalent to having a strong monoidal functor from the category V to the category of endomorphisms on X. So I'm gonna take this as definition. A category X is a tangent category if and only if it has a strong monoidal functor from V into endomorphisms on X, which preserves those tangent, the two pullbacks that I just showed you which together are called the tangent pullbacks. Um, so this is a much more attractive way if you're working in homotopy theory to approach tangent categories than looking at a long list of axioms because every axiom that I would have to um, include would require me to deal with some coherence issues. And um, this, is, this is a much cleaner way to think about what a tangent category is. And it's the reason that I've chosen to, to um, display this definition instead. And the idea here, as I noted before, is inspired by synthetic differential geometry. So in particular, we really want to look at um, the dual numbers.
These play the role of infinitesimal curves. So really what I wanna do is think about the value of T of W, which I will denote because I'm gonna have several variables going on. From now on, I'm gonna denote that with an exponent. So if I look at the image of W under this functor, we'll just call that TW. And somehow, and that thing itself is gonna be a functor from X to X. And that one is the one that plays the role of the tangent bundle. And the structure that I told you the category of they has guarantees that this particular functor is going to act just like a tangent bundle functor as we would expect. Okay. All right, from there, now I can start to think about what might happen to define a tangent infinity category instead of just a tangent category. So working with the category of A tells me what to do in order to um, make it, sorry, um, I got a little distracted by the chat. So Sasha, I'll get to your question in just a second. So um, this definition, this theorem that I gave you tells me what to do if it turns out that I want to define what tangent categories are. What if I now want to work up to homotopy? One way to do that would be to try to take this definition and turn it into something that applies to tangent infinity categories. Okay, so let me just get at the question. Um, the, the top map of the first pullback seems to be in the wrong direction. Right, so maybe I should have um, dwelled a little bit more on the fact that I talked about what these things are already, so that I, I have um, already told you what W times W is and what W tends for W is. So in the end, all of the maps kind of do what you think that they should do. So that top map is just sending XY to XY and, um, and not hitting the, the product XY so that, anyway, I'm not saying this very well, but um, just send X, what I really meant to say was just send X to X and Y to Y, and you will in fact get the map that, that um, you're expecting there. Okay, whereas the right-hand map sends X and Y and evaluates them at the same variable. Okay, all right, so this is a tangent category, and now I wanna talk about tangent infinity categories. And the first thing that I should do is tell you what I mean by infinity categories. So in this talk, an infinity category is a quasi-category. That is, it's a simplicial set which satisfies an inner horn condition. Um, I think in this audience, I might not need to say too much more about what I mean by an infinity category, but on the off chance that you've never heard of them before, you should be thinking about, it as an, inf about an infinity category as a category in which all of the usual axioms hold only up to coherence. Um, I will acknowledge that there are model independent notions of what it means to be an infinity category, um, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to stick with quasi categories. And the last thing that I want to say is that um, if you're really, really uncomfortable with infinity categories, every category is an infinity category. And of course, um, the relationship between these is that the nerve of a category produces a simplicial set. So what I'm really telling you is that the nerve of the category is the right kind of simplicial set to be thought of as an infinity category. And there's no harm in the rest of this talk of just thinking about those simplicial sets that come from nerves of categories. That would be fine. Okay. And then um, I want to have, because of the fact that the, the definition of tangent category uses monoidal functors, I really want monoidal infinity categories. So a monoidal infinity category just means in this case, um, a simplicial monoid
whose underlying simplicial set is a quasi-category. Okay. Okay. Well, now that we have those definitions, it's quite easy to figure out how to generalize the definition of an infinity category to, the, to be an infinity category. So um, first note that the category ve being a monoidal category is automatically a monoidal infinity category. And in fact, as a monoidal infinity category, it's called fibrant. And um, that justifies the definition that a tangent infinity category should just be an infinity category X together with a strict monoidal functor T from V to the endomorphism category of X. Um, the underlying map, and again, as before, the underlying map of quasi categories has to preserve those two pullback diagrams that I showed you earlier. So the fact that it's a strict monoidal functor um, we there we're using the fact that they is cofibrant as a monoidal infinity category, so that um, this is the right homotop the right notion of being an infinity category kind of up to homotopy as well. All right, so let me just run through just talk about a couple of rather trivial examples. So the first thing is that if you're a tangent category. you're automatically a tangent infinity category. Can I ask, what, what's the zero on the x, x zero? Okay, so I use as my notation, the symmetric monoidal product is showing up in the exponent and oh, that okay. is composition. Oh, yeah, it. so I'm just trying to say that the endomorphism category is monoidal under composition. And I, I forgot see. to say it out loud, so thanks for asking. Okay. Um, okay, so a tangent category is a tangent infinity category. And the other thing that we can do to kind of, so that's maybe not so satisfying because you had to know you were a tangent category to begin with. The other thing we can do is we can start with an arbitrary infinity category X. And these are gonna be tangent categories. just by giving it a trivial tangent structure. So in this case, my trivial tangent structure is the one that tells me that on the, that on the special tangent, uh, special value of the tangent functor, I just do the identity. So this is the one that takes the dual numbers and sends it to the identity functor. That turns out to extend to a tangent infinity structure, but in a very trivial way. So this doesn't give you any extra information about the category. So um, of course the example that I'm after is a more interesting tangent structure that's not so trivial, that tells you how this tangent structure might arise from homotopy functor calculus. So that tangent structure we call the good Willie tangent structure. To do that, I need to, um, to, to use this structure, I need to um, have rather special infinity categories. So an infinity category is called Lurie differentiable if it admits finite limits and sequential co-limits and those commute. That hypothesis is very familiar to people who are working in homotopy functor calculus. And I'll just denote the subcategory of Lurie differentiable categories by cat diff. Um, we call it Lurie differentiable because in category theory, in the, um, the categorical differentiation theory, that, that area of mathematics, they also have a notion of differentiable. So we put the decoration to try to, I put the decoration in this talk to keep the two notions separate. Okay, um, so then Lurie himself had defined a tangent bundle on cat diff. So the tangent bundle of a Lurie differentiable infinity category is defined to be the infinity category of excisive functors from 
S thin star into C. And here, S thin star is the infinity category. of finite pointed simplicial complexes. Okay, and this, um, this stands for excisive functors. So there was already a candidate for a tangent bundle and what Michael and Matthew and I did was show that in fact, this tangent bundle, which is made out of the excisive functors, so the building blocks of homotopy functor calculus can be extended to a functor which is strictly monoidal from the category of A into the endomorphism category of the infinity category of, different, of Lurie differentiable infinity categories. That's a mouthful. Um, and that in fact gives a tangent infinity structure on, um, on that category that I don't want to say out loud again. All right, so let me just tell you a few things about the structure um, of, about how you extend the structure. So these are some hints about the proof as well. Well, remember that every VE algebra has the form, um, basically they are, they're all generated by W. So if I have an arbitrary VE algebra of this type, then I have to tell you what to do on TA. That's supposed to be an endomorphism of some category C. So this is going to be the excisive functors. There's a decoration, which I'll say out loud in a moment, of the category that I get by taking products of the category S star fin, so the category of um, the infinity category of finite simplicial complexes. So I'm going to take the product of that n1 times, and then I'll take the product of that again with itself, one for each w that appears. And I'll take those, I'll take the functors from there into C, which are excisive. in each of the R variables separately. So of course, this is a functor of many more variables, but we group them into R variables according to where those WNs appear. And we think about it as, as being excisive in each of those variables separately. And that turns out to be the value of um, this functor T on A. And the second thing that I have to do is I have to tell you what to do if um, I have a functor F from C to D so that I can convince you that this thing is indeed a functor. Well, of course, post-composition will define a functor. Post-composition with F will define a functor on HOM sets or HOM, uh, maybe I want to call these, maybe I should have used um, fun here for functors instead of HOM. Okay. But post-composition might not preserve the excisive property. So to define what, what TA of F is, we take the excisive approximation of post-composition. In other words, um, so I'll just say, if I started with a functor L 
in the domain of that arrow that I just wrote down, note that P1 of FL is P1F of P1L. And that tells me how to take that excisive approximation. Okay. Okay. So that's a little bit about how this theorem is structured. I haven't told you everything that you need to know, but this is enough to give you some idea of what's going on. So what this accomplished was a way of making precise the analogy between Goodwill's calculus of functors and differential calculus by giving them a framework in which, in which both of them could exist. Um, so that's kind of what the motivation was, but I wanna make this a little bit more concrete and tie this back exactly to the kinds of theorems that we had at the beginning where we really produced a derivative. So let me show you now how we might do that. To produce a derivative, um, the theory of tangent categories tells me that I should not expect that every functor of tangent categories has a derivative. I should only expect that the differentiable ones have derivatives. So I have to tell you what differentiable is in this case. Um, and um, differential is just going to mean that it has a deliberate has a, a derivative, um, but in particular, um, this happens in the infinity category case only if I have a stable infinity category. Sorry, I'm talking a little bit circularly right now, but um, what we really expect from the geometry of this is that the categories which are differentiable ought to be those categories which have a trivial tangent space. The ones that have trivial tangent spaces turn out to be exactly the stable infinity categories. Um, I've written the de definition of stable above. That means that it um, that C is stable if, it, if it's pointed, admits finite limits and co-limits, and a square is a pushout if and only if it's a pullback. And so from Lurie, It's not surprising that the stable infinity categories are going to be the ones that are differentiable because these are the ones that look like um, tangent spaces. So if C is any infinity category, then it's tangent space. So that's just the pullback over the evaluation map just as it was before. Well, this is going to be weakly equivalent to the pointed excisive functors from finite simplicial sets into the slice category C over X, which tells me that, and um, Lurie proved that this is stable. So the first thing that that tells me is that anything that's already a tangent space is stable. The second thing is that if C is stable, then C is equivalent to the tangent space over a point. So the stable categories are tangent spaces and the tangent spaces are stable. And that's enough to tell me that the stable categories are the ones that are differentiable. And then the important thing to conclude here then is that in that case where it turns out that you have a category that's differentiable, um, Cockett and Crutwell tell us that we should expect the, the subcategory of differentiable categories to be the ones that have, that are Cartesian differential categories. And in fact, you can now produce the derivative in exactly the way that you could in the abelian case. So that um, this ties back to the notion of how it is that these tangent categories are actually gonna produce derivatives. So there is the Goodwillie derivative sitting there as the derivatives for these stable infinity categories. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that's all I have to say today and I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Christine. Let's. Uh... Thanks, Christine, in whichever way you prefer to do. So I guess since there's